Hi, everybody. We are really excited to talk about AI in next best action systems today. I am Nathan Lesnowski. I am Concurrency's Chief Technology Officer, and we're going to be talking a little bit about how this has been applied in the financial services industry. I am uh, glad to see everyone here. What we're going to start with today is I just want to get a little perspective of where you are in applying next best action within your business. So I'm going to put a poll out there. Oh, you can't hear me. Hopefully other people can. Um, Amy, am I coming through okay? Yeah, you're coming through for me okay. Okay, thank you. Great. Okay, so we're going to start this off by having a, a little bit of a poll of where you are with your next best action implementation. Say that 10 times fast. So I'm going to launch that poll and the options that you can select from are I'm not sure what it is. Why am I here? I've never heard of next best action before. Uh, the second is I'm exploring it, haven't put it into production, haven't really started to you know, really get any real wins out of it. Uh, the fourth would be I already have some part of it in production, but I'm not using AI. It's more statically driven. And then the last is we have an AI solution in production, which if you're in that point, I would love to talk with you more. Um, so please fill out that poll and I'd love to, uh, let's see where you guys are at already. I'll give you, I'll give you about uh, 10 seconds, 10 more seconds to fill this out. Okay, thank you. All right, so it looks like about 20% of you are not sure what it is, so we'll make sure we define that for you. Thanks for answer, answering that way. Um, we we have about 40% of you that are exploring it, and another 40% that have started to put it into, oh, it's changing already, 29% uh, that have already have some part of it in production without AI, and 14% already have an AI solution in production. So really looking forward to learning more about uh, that solution as well. So awesome. This is great. So this is going to be a session where you can feel free to drop any question you want into the chat, uh, provided it's not about whether you can hear me or not. Just kidding. Um, please make sure that you uh, ask those questions. We're going to answer them as we go. Um, we have a variety of different concurrency members on this call in addition to myself. So we can answer those real time and I'd love to have them come up as we hit different parts of the presentation. So um, feel free to let them fly. So let's start by just defining what next best action scenarios really are. Um, I think an important way to think about this is thinking about the capabilities of AI in the context of what we can do now and what we are going to have the opportunity to do. Uh, a next best action system is where you have the opportunity to be able to define, in, especially in the financial services space, to define what the preferred action is based upon a set of criteria. So uh, let's imagine that you have a financial services advisor and you know that that advisor has a uh, customer with a portfolio and that portfolio indicates that they're not going to have enough money by the time that they retire. And the result of that is that they'll run out of money and they'll be you know, 75 years old and have already exhausted their available funds. What would you prefer for that financial advisor to do at this given point with that customer? And maybe even what is the customer's next best action at that point? Is it to increase their savings? Is it to increase the amount they put away into their 401k or to another savings vehicle? And uh, what you might experience within your organization is that there's a diversity among the choices that many of your financial advisors or your customers would take upon that point. But you know that there are certain paths that are intentionally the best for that customer to move down. So what Next Best Action is about is optimizing both your team's journey and helping your customers to take appropriate actions. It may be unearthing journeys that they're unaware of. Think about things like um, 
multi uh, relational families, you have different uh, tiers of relationships you might have, you might have situations occurring that the financial advisor isn't even aware of, um, or you might have inexperienced advisors that don't know how to guide in a particular situation. So your goal is to help them. So how does how does AI help us in that scenario? Well, the ways it would help us is by predicting that something's going to happen, like I'm going to run out of retirement funds, and then prescribing what to do about that. And those are two situations that we've been using AI for a while for. These are not necessarily new to financial services, but they're opportunities that continue to become more efficient and more capable every day. So the first step on that journey is we're predicting something based upon a data set. So I know something about a person's financial position. I'm predicting what's going to happen based upon their current amount of spend or their predicted spend uh, with that data set. So again, the situation is that person is not doesn't have enough retirement savings for their level of income, their level of monthly spend, and what's going to happen after they pull the trigger on retirement. What you may, might then do um, is you might go into a pattern where you then prescribe what to do about that. And we just talked about uh, the situation like prescription. So you might say uh, increase your 401k or you might say uh, reduce your spending might be another prescription. And you need to enable that financial advisor to uh, apply that advisement once they know about the situation. You'll notice that these two activities are different than what we might do with normal analytics. A lot of analytics situations, we give data to a person, but they don't know what to do with it or they don't even necessarily know what it's predicting. So our goal with AI is to take a step beyond analytics and help our advisors, help our customers, help uh, our sales motions to be predicting what the right customers are to have conversations with and to prescribe what to do about it. But then what, where it might go from here is to storytell on those larger data sets. So storytelling in the context of AI might mean based upon this situation and these prescribed actions, what would happen if I did X? And those are scenarios that you can help to model for your advisors or help to model for your, uh, your customers that might even do it themselves in the context of your online assets. So storytelling is that next step around AI that enables us to help them to make strategic decisions, not just tactical decisions. So then, you know, based upon those things, that that sounds like a pretty uh, sort of taught understanding of next best action. So what are the rest of this stuff? So what we've started to emerge from in these these first activities, these have been around for a while. What we started to see is that general activities have started to become a thing in the context of AI. And this is really where GPT models have made some of this conversation substantially more capable. So general directed activities, meaning uh, activities that are more general in nature, but they're still directed by a person. So it might be something like, here's a, here's a report about my customer, my, uh, my person I'm advising, uh, return back to me things like the net income and what the uh, evaluation score for their retirement plan is and what their investment mix is and whether it's appropriate for the period of time. And you can start to inform that to think through that process a little bit closer to the way that a human might think through that process. So it's like the idea of general directed activities is something that has become a thing with the advent of large language models, which lets us start to move into directed autonomous activities. So an example of this in next best action might be, all right, I already know that I might be able to look at a particular financial plan and provide some perspective on what that person should do. Well, maybe now that I know the, the boundaries of what that is, I can say, go look at my thousand different financial plans and come back with the 15 customers that I need to prioritize this week to have a conversation with because of what it's predicting about their financial ecosystem. And that's causing the AI agent to do something that uh, perhaps a person might have spent a fair amount of time on in preparing for the financial advisor, or maybe they wouldn't have done it all, which is oftentimes the case, um, in order for them to normalize the activities. And at, at which point you start to move into this idea of creative directive activities, which is about how should I, how could I change my portfolio? And so you, you already noticed that some of the even GPT models can start to make intelligent decisions about uh, 
changes to portfolios or changes to mixes of investments based upon the intuitive nature of that. But you might even get to a point where you, some of that falls into the creative category where um, where a human has to has traditionally had to think about that as part of their their journey. You'll notice that AI tools are starting to help the creative journey for an individual as well as they're thinking about the context of the portfolio and how they can help an individual. So that's that's essentially where we land now. Where we're going is this idea of general or creative autonomous activities being part of the AI skill set as well. Now that's not uh, where many of these scenarios exist yet, but it's definitely where we're going to get to where uh, uh, portfolio optimization that was once not possible through robo advisors and bot driven experiences are now becoming a capability of what we have the ability to deliver through our AI platforms as part of the journey that we're, we're going through. Now you may start down here just to get through the blocking and tackling and helping to provide value back to your customers. But know that there's a journey that you can move through as you're starting to think about this. So if you as you have questions about this particular breakdown, put them in the chat and I'll hit them as we uh, as we go along here. Or I'll hit them at the end if uh, if there's a situation where you have some more questions. OK, so let's let's take a step back for a second. All that's interesting. Let's frame up the journey just a little bit before we go into uh, into the specifics of next best action. So as you're starting to leverage AI in this ecosystem, uh, I always think that this is an important thing to think about is that many companies have already started right here. They're already starting in a value in a scenario. They're already thinking about how they can apply this capability to their customers or their employees value streams. It's really important as you are engaging in your AI cycle to bring this back to the executive level because this is truly a business changing capability within your organization. Even if you've done next best action before and you've done it in a way which is very uh, sort of rules driven, you can get to a point where it expands upon what a rules driven a engine can do. And the reason why the executive alignment is so important is this is going to start to change in a really dramatic way the jobs of all your team members and how they engage with their customers and how they optimize the outcomes for their customers. So it's really important that you back up the train, get to the executive alignment of how you're going to leverage this across your company, and then you bring that forward into where these capabilities can be driven into POC and pilots and production, and ultimately what this looks like is a scaled pattern across the organization. But reminder always to pull that back to the executive the executive organization. What we've seen is that companies that try to pursue some of these too fast without having that executive alignment, they they run into challenges at POC purgatory and they're not able to get it pushed through uh, because the business isn't aligned. The business isn't part of the adoption cycle. So as we start to path this forward, um, one other sort of framing thing I want you to think about is that in your AI solution space, there's a variety of tools that are going to fit into this picture and next best action really isn't a, uh, a sort of immune to this. Many of the things we're doing in next best action will fit into simple commodity capabilities that are available through tools we already have. There's platforms that you know let us take a look at our financial portfolios today that are going to start to develop AI tools. But many of the competitive advantages that companies are working on are ones where there's direct investment necessary for you to gain ground against other companies in the same space. And we call those mission driven, ones where you're investing above and beyond what the commodity market is providing to you to enable outcomes that are specific to your organization's investment portfolio choices, your philosophy, the way you think about this picture. And I think that's where you're gonna see delineation is certain organizations have certain investment philosophies or even customers have certain investment philosophies where next best action is going to be specific to a customer, not just specific to an organization. So a few things that you might be thinking about as we're talking about next best action and AI specifically are these blockers. And I want to hit these, you know, I, I hesitated. I'm like, do I want to cover these in this section? This is sort of a uh, generic topic. Like I know everybody kind of wants to learn about next best action specifically. But uh, every time I talk about one of these scenarios with a financial company, um, I was just with an executive team yesterday talking about it. This is the thing that comes up first. They all want to understand how they clear some of these blockers. So I want to make sure that this is something you can take home and have as an asset for you. 
The biggest concern everybody has is around the context of data privacy. Um, and part of that is the effective fear, uncertainty, and doubt that's uh, that's very true around some AI platforms. Like what your, some of your financial advisors may even be doing is using uh, ChatGPT or putting things into the Google search interface that suddenly become part of the trained internet. And that's a really problematic situation. So uh, you'll notice that like many tools that can do textual analysis or visual analysis to help optimize a, a portfolio or a choice or something based upon a document can be used uh, very quickly to like, even without your assent, your acceptance um, to be able to do next best action. So um, it's really important that you be very intentional about what tools your employees are using to do this. A, because you want to make sure that there are low hallucinations or low and that the choice is aligned to your investment uh, philosophy. And uh, B, you want to have data privacy so you can stand up to the regulations that you're held accountable to. So uh, very important that anything you're building is using private instances of AI, of AI models. So that is something A, to hold your vendors accountable to, but B, also something to hold yourself accountable to as you're building these solutions. So data privacy concerns really come into play. It's, it's actually not that difficult to, uh, to align to because most of the solutions like Azure or Microsoft or uh, NFIS or something like that, they're already building around some of these controls. Um, but because it's something that's evolving every day, and especially for some of you that might do work in the European Union, and other places, some of this is evolving in a way that we have to be very conscious of. So data privacy concerns uh, comes into play and it's necessary to use private instances and have walls that mitigate non-private instances from being used. The second uh, use case is in this scenario of data readiness. Uh, this is a little bit of a boogeyman, right? Like sometimes we're like, my, my data not being ready uh, it can be like a three-year journey and then you can go to the ball. Like this is more about a specific use case with specific data sets, understanding in the context of building up financial planning or other tools that we're directing our customers on, what am I causing them to, um, what data do I need to be successful at that? Uh, historically, purposely, what data will have successful outcomes? What data will not have successful outcomes? And then especially like what data should be used to accomplish an outcome um, and not get a little too bullish on how that data might be used. So data readiness is more about functional data readiness on a specific use case, specific value stream than it is about the entire the entirety of the entire meta like set of your organization's data in and of itself. And that, that sounds sort of obvious to say, but oftentimes it's not obvious to people adopting AI. Um, the third scenario, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later, is this idea on human displacement. Um, I really recommend that executive teams turn that comment around from exec human displacement to human enablement. This idea that AI is a force multiplier, that every individual within your organization should have the power to be more as a result of using AI. And that's very true for financial advisors, especially ones that uh, may be generational in nature. Like there's some financial advisors that they've done it a certain way for a long time, and maybe they're maybe they're retiring when their their clients retire, um, and that's okay. That that's something that that worked out fine for them. Many people are looking for a much more engaged uh, in financial advisement experience, and different generations are also looking for more do-it-yourself kinds of experiences, um, especially as you have relationships between, say, say, the parent and the children and the grandchildren. So human displacement and human skills, human enablement, are what you're trying to drive from both your own employees and your customers as part of your AI solutions. Um, and in this space, probably the second biggest concern is around quality. What if it gets it wrong? What if it's the wrong answer to this question? Um, and that is where I find a lot of uh, sort of solace because um, there's a lot of ability for us to test the outcomes of their AI solutions and to build confidence around the outcomes that we can validate. Um, in many cases, that's not the case for our financial advisors today. They are making decisions based upon their own sort of perspective at the time. Um, and if we can guide them to make more make decisions that are optimized, then maybe the outcome for our customers will be optimized as well because they're very data driven and they're very um, prescriptive. Um, and then this last one that comes into play in the financial services industry for sure 
um, and particularly coming into play with some other financial scenarios like loans and, and approvals is bias. And, you know, this is more about understanding your data and what the data will be used for and using it for ways that are appropriate for the outcomes for different uh, person, uh, human groups, as well as ways that that data might be used and unintended consequences is super important and something to consider as part of your responsible AI adoption. So all these things need to be part of how you are going down an adoption pattern. And if you can't check every one of these boxes, you need to pause for a minute and make sure you know how to check the boxes. So as we start to think about AI and FinServe use cases, understand that there's sort of three different domains that might be happening with parallel paths inside of your organization that you might be adopting. You might have commodity AI solutions that are starting to let be leveraged for things like next best action or, or even things like writing an email. Um, you might have semi-custom solutions where you're putting things together. Maybe you're using something like Copilot Studio to build solutions or Power Platform. Um, or in this case, which is probably the, the primary scenario, is you're building a custom ML scenario, client portfolio optimization. You're turning data into a decision framework. You're building a high visibility chatbot that gives very specific answers. And the reason why I bring this up is because you have some of these other use cases happening within the, the ecosystem, uh, it's important to note that like these kinds of things, especially for financial services, next best action solutions, really do require a high degree of uh, precision and accuracy. Not that that isn't obvious to many of you on the phone, on the call here, but it is something to really keep in mind that um, as you're building these, it requires very intentional engineering. So let's go through how this all sort of fits together in the context of uh, next best action. So some of these banking and capital market scenarios are more about customer support. Where we're going to see next best action really take hold um, is in A, how do I respond to a customer support scenario? This is something that's sort of not always uh, thought about in next best action, but it's certainly one that is important because an unhappy customer is one less likely to do effective work with us. That gets connected into the knowledge base scenarios. So things that I need to know to provide a great customer experience. What happens when I have an unhappy customer? What do I do about that? How do I provide them the best support experience from that, that uh, path? So customer support is sort of scenario one. Scenario two is about creating a relationship between wealth management teams, the multi-generational relationships, the pitch book, and action that happens within those teams to create this ongoing relationship with a customer where I'm optimizing their portfolio and uh, aware of what's happening within their, their uh, portfolio so I can drive intelligent insight to make them select the right choices to lead to the right outcomes. And all of that is tied in with a team of people that are helping them. Maybe some people have very specific expertise within that, that team. And one of the challenges can be getting those people to work well together, actually selecting the action, understanding who I'm communicating with, and next best action can really guide teams to be able to select the right choice, especially based on previous activities that have happened with the same customer or other likely customers that can create great outcomes, which relates into insights that you might be gathering from their portfolio and helping to have intelligent conversations with those customers, and then also a conversation about risk management. And this is about essentially analyzing portfolios, looking for risk, looking for opportunities for your customers to have better outcomes and for enabling your advisors to be able to have intelligent conversations with those customers. That really relates into all these things. Claim automation, that's more of an insurance scenario. And then fraud detection uh, certainly comes into play, which is less of a next best action conversation and more of a, uh, a, a protection scenario. Okay, so in this space, um, I'm seeing two different types of innovation happening. One is a sort of slow incremental innovation surrounding the work that you're already doing with them. So you may have a flow that a customer goes through presently, and that flow is simply being augmented by AI or even a rules engine to help them to make intelligent choices. And that's that's less about disrupting the entire market and more about um, just helping them through an existing journey. 
The other scenario might be this starts to pivot toward changing the way the market engages with your customers. And perhaps that's about letting certain types of groups within your customer set to do more work on their own. Um, and I know that's already a, a sort of area that this business space is contending with is how do I enable more of my customers to optimize their own portfolios in the context of choices they can already make? And then how do I enable us to gain more ground on top of what they're already doing uh, via investment or via uh, advisement? So the disruptive engine can be about usurping the way that many uh, many advisors have traditionally done business and helping a, a model that might be more suited to certain uh, groups in the population or ways of people who would prefer investment in a certain area or types of income levels to gain outcomes that are specific to them. Okay, so let's hit the the um, the uh, scenario on customer service first, and then we'll go into the sort of financial advisement uh, zone. So uh, let's say that you have a, a user who calls in and or if a person who's being advised and they have a negative experience or they have to make a change to their portfolio and they're having a conversation with someone within your team. And many organizations, they started to record these calls and they, they you know, they started to record them historically, you know, in really low quality call centers just to like almost as like a check, a gen, general check. But where this has started to go is to coach the person on the call to even make real-time changes or real-time optimizations to the story that they're driving with that customer. You can already see this in certain tools, even in PowerPoint with things like Presenter Coach, you're starting to see this be a uh, part of the conversational flow. So we worked with some very large scale organizations around uh, adopting this across many, many, many call centers to be able to understand like what is the quality of their calls and how do we coach our individuals to make better choices when they're they're helping a customer to have a better relationship with us. So that might mean uh, an appropriate intro. It might mean information that was provided in a way that the customer accepted it. It might mean converting the tone, like uh, did I move the customer from an unhappy state to an ambivalent state to a happy state? Um, did I have an effective follow-up coming out of that call? Um, so next best action sometimes can even mean like, what's the next best action inside the current conversation I'm having with a customer real time to lead to a better outcome with them? Um, and it's amazing what's happening with real time automation right now to enable people to make effective choices. Um, this is also something that, of course, can be done at scale. So you might find that this is something that uh, could be applied across uh, an analytics basis to know like how are all my call centers doing like who's the best at this who's the worst at this how, how did i do um and you're seeing some of this start to happen um inside of even tools like copilot you know which are excellent at interpreting something that happened within the context of call re relating that back to a outcome that had happened as a result of it and it being very clear and understanding even the tone of that happened during the meeting you can see where it was polite respectful like this is not something technology could do even um, you know, a year ago. This is something that's coming so fast in order for us to enable uh, a, a, an understanding that's a more akin to the way a human thinks about this picture than just like a one or a zero is, is whether or not like, did I have a particular data point that was in that conversation? No, I'm asking about the tone of the conversation and what, how did, what did the tone start with? What did the tone end with? Or even things that I can gather based upon insights from calls. Um, I also might then need to understand the action items and pull those action items into how that person then helps that customer. So in the call, maybe we're prescribing next best action, and then maybe we're also capturing those actions and pulling those into activities that that person might take. And I, I, I think this is really like sort of low hanging fruit for many organizations because normalizing customer service has become something that's really tricky for organizations to gain ground in because there's a diversity of, of talent, of uh, longevity that they've been at the organization, knowledge that they might have, even arming them with the right knowledge is a big step. So um, I, uh, I took this next step. I took a, uh, a cash flow analysis. It's kind of going to some of these financial things. I took a quick cash flow analysis from Monarch um, happens to be, this is not my finances, but um, it's a good example of one. And I, I was, I thought this was an interesting way for us to kind of start the conversation, which is what is a non-obvious conclusion from this image? 
and uh, to a certain extent, you can gather a lot of that yourselves, right? Which is cool. Um, but one thing that we couldn't do with tech even very uh, recently was have it reason through if you use the word reason, right? If you have it reason through a diagram or outcomes in a way which is similar to that of a human. So some things that um, this started, I sort of pumped this into an AI experience and asked what's a non-obvious conclusion from this image. And the image you sent is a screenshot of financial management software interface, et cetera, et cetera. You have steady income, managing expenses well. You have a high savings rate above the average. So you return that back from a general, uh, sort of general average. Spend a large portion of your income on services, subscriptions, memberships. You may want to review the expenses. So this is like an unprompted view of, hey, you're a financial advisor. I mean, not always. Um, this, what I found from this is you can start to ask questions. You start to ask questions. You start to direct what. Uh, are my optimized choices based upon certain scenarios? So maybe the high savings rate is great, but the way that they have op they optimized that into the different parts of this portfolio are not uh, not the right choice. Uh, maybe it's this idea of like you don't have any side hustles, <laughs> um, and you might want to start diversifying your income streams. All these are choices that you might start leading a customer down, and I think the idea of combining very analytical driven um, AI next best action models that are doing pers uh, that are doing prediction and prescription with GPT centric models that have this sort of human conclusion reasoning sort of interface, bringing those together to help create a, a meaningful engagement with a customer, either through directly through the customer um, financial advisor or directly to the customer through a bot type of inter type interface or a side loaded interface can be really powerful. Um, you can also see a scenario like this where you might take an analysis from a customer and use that at scale. So, for example, um, did an analysis of a Monte Carlo summary of a customer, understanding the upside case, median case, downside case. And here it's finding that there's 0% successful trial of the couple's current savings and investment strategy, highly unlikely to meet their financial goals. It's essentially concluding something from a set of data that exists in the for, in the, the content, um, but not necessarily something that an individual might always know. And what's interesting about this is you might load up a series of questions, right? So you might say like, I need to know 25 things about a customer's portfolio before I go into an advising session with them. What does their Monte Carlo analysis uh, say about their portfolio? What is their current net worth? How is it distributed among different resources? Tell me about their existing net income. What's their current expenses? You might dump all that out into an interface or it might ask certain questions um, and almost like de-risk the customer as you're going through the appropriate uh, conditions. And then based on that, you might even doing it scale. What percentage of portfolios have greater than 25% chance, chance of missing savings goals after they consider the Monte Carlo summary? Now, of course, you can do that through a traditional ML model, but that might also miss certain correct, uh, correct characteristics of the report or aspects of it. So you might combine those two things together to arrive at what an appropriate next step might look like. So how does this all kind of come together? Well, you have a team of people that are working as wealth management teams. They are they're working on focused areas. Maybe you have uh, the, a team member that works on uh, long-term financial planning versus another one is doing their operational planning versus another one thinks about retirement, like taking money out. Um, and it's difficult for a person to maybe be an expert at all modalities that exist within the picture. One way to think about AI in this context is it is essentially another team member which is kind of odd to think, right? Like, but essentially its goal is to function as another team member. Its goal should be for your financial analysis to, to individuals to be able to offload these capabilities to that sort of financial analysis AI team member to do that research like we've been talking about, meeting prep, portfolio analysis, or even prescribe what they're going to do about it, which is essentially what we're talking about in next best action. So you might say, research this possibility for my customer, return this data from my portfolio. Tell me about recent situations that have happened or what changes should I make? And this is truly where you get to next best action is what should I do about that 
based upon our investment philosophy. And that's where I've seen it truly come home for many organizations is, it's not just about like generically, what would you do about this? Like some questions are, right? Like save more money. Like you don't save anything, like save more money, right? Um, but there's a difference between say maybe what, uh, just to drop a name, like maybe like what a, a Dave Ramsey might say versus a h and blah, or the, a, a, a some large financial planning organization might say, right? There's a there's a difference between those some philosophies. You need to determine what your organizational philosophy is. It's not just up to one person. What's your organizational philosophy? And how do I align that to the prescription associated with a particular wealth management team? Um, and allowing that to what my customers' goals are. So you might have an organizational philosophy, but then maybe there's specifics you can capture about a customer that allow you to pivot that philosophy based upon their individual goals. And that's what can help your financial advisors not only to be more effective at helping your customers, but also be more effective at uh, prescribing the right action that leads to good outcomes. <laughs> um, if if they're trying to go through a certain period of life, maybe that period of life is just it just objectively optimized by taking a certain action that we happen to know about. So um, when you think about personalizing those contents, um, essentially what you have is you have a customer and that customer has historical account and behavior data. And we know this because we interact with them as financial advisors, right? So like we, we have a certain degree of that. Now, one thing you might also find is that like you don't interact with them enough, so you don't know enough about them as an individual advisor. So you're just kind of winging it. That's not what we want. We want to optimize the experience. So we have this historical data and this would be digital events that have happened with them, what they've attended, conversations that we can gather into the picture. Um, this might be like conversations with their financial advisor that we've recorded in transcripts that uh, are able to be summarized. So for example, let's have a say a cust uh, financial advisor has a great conversation with a customer and they what traditionally would write that down in notes on a piece of paper or a, in, a, in a financial planning document or in CRM or something, right? They capture that somewhere. How effective are is an average financial advisor at taking notes in a standardized way from their customer? <laughs> Maybe not that great, right? Uh, we want to optimize that process. So what if I simply had call transcription on and I used a tool like Copilot to be able to capture that uh, customer call and we're able to suck that into uh, effective call transcripts that could be used for next best action. Like that would be tremendously more effective than what they potentially did in the past. Um, and they'd be able to optimize their time investment. So even some simple things like that can start to uh, start to invest in the actual data you have to optimize the portfolio for a customer. Um, this might also then move into chats you've had with them or uh, what they bought or haven't bought in the context of your financial products or their uh, demographics, which you have to be extremely careful about because that's where some of that uh, sort of bias situations might come into. Um, but ultimately, you have this historical body of data that enters into different drivers in the portfolio, things you want, the prices that they'll buy things at, the risk that they're willing to take, the quality of relationship they want with the financial advisor. Like, is this just a robo situation or do they really want a like super high quality uh, ongoing relationship? Or maybe different parts of that family want different uh, levels of relationship with us. So all that feeds into um, your next best action portfolio that says based upon these criteria, the data about the person, the behaviors and the risk profile, we're then feeding that into here's what you should do about it. This is your optimal action based upon this set of things. And that might mean a call like like based upon what we just learned, we need to get in touch with them because there's problems with their portfolio or there's actions that they need to be taking. Maybe we let it lapse. We let them go. They're, we're not, they're not a great customer for us. We just let them move on. Maybe there's opportunities for them to choose to uh, uh, buy something from our portfolio uh, based upon some criteria, or we run a promo with them. Um, but even more so, like we're trying to influence them to make great, great optimal behaviors. We want to help them to make great choices. And this is this is traditionally like a true ML model, but we're finding is that that ML model is combined with some gen AI capabilities um, and other things we know about that customer to be able to provide a great experience. And that's where I think the gen AI world is starting to really help help us create a great outcome is 
And what we can do with static data, ML models behind the scenes enables us to create great experiences. Um, and that might be in some level of communications back to that customer around different ways to optimize their portfolio, whether it's through a person that they're interacting with, or it's through a AI agent or both that are then working as a team. Remember, we have this idea of like a, a wealth management team essentially being an AI team member in the context of uh, the work that you're doing. Okay. Um, so at the root, personalizing communications, personalizing customer experiences and action are what is at the root of next best action. So I have a customer, we want them to take action on something based upon improving their net promoter score, their conversion, their engagement, the lifetime value of their portfolio and making the right choices. If we don't take the right actions, what happens is there are more complaints. There's more people who move on to other advisors. There's more costs. They have worse lifetime value. And ultimately we know those choices. Like in many cases, we, we know as a business what a customer can do to make their organization stronger or sorry, to make their portfolio stronger. And if we simply had uh, the, the ability to tell all of our advisors and all our customers to take those actions, we know that our portfolios would be stronger. We know they'd be better off. Um, so this is about leading them down that right path. And AI enables us to do that in a way that is much more uh, tuned to their specific needs than we ever have had the ability to do before. And it also enables us to be uh, a great partner for the financial advisor to help them to be more efficient as they have to deal with a variety of scenarios. This also can come into play with multi-generational relationships. So let's say you have a relationship with the parent um, and that is your primary customer that you're doing, um, doing financial advisory work with. You don't have a relationship with the child or maybe you have with one of the children and you certainly may not have any, oh, I spelled that wrong. Um, you may not have any relationship with a grandchild. Um, so this idea of, this idea of uh, optimizing the relationship between different levels of the family and using AI to help with the optimization of that. So this may be more online or, or uh, app-based experiences, or maybe even this is just getting them into the conversation around financial management and making them part of the portfolio family. But oftentimes the way that the advisor has worked with the parent is very disaligned to how the child wants to work. And you have to figure out with the AI platform and other tools, how to cross that barrier, how to A, market to the different levels of this group, but also create relationships across this group with a cohesive set of tools that helps them be effective. And that might mean that this, this team, this wealth management team is made up of agent, 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 maybe an AI agent that all work together with the same portfolio understanding and actions that the child and grandchild might start here and then start to expand to have a full agent as part of their picture, uh, or even as a result of the relationship with the parent, you're starting to market into and do proactive actions within those children or grandchildren activities. But that's all driven by next best action. And that's all driven by us prompting people. If there's one thing we know about, you know, sales in general, advisement in general, is that sometimes people, so there's really great people that outperform their portfolio and there's people that don't. And a lot of times it's about doing the work. It's about doing the actions that need to be done to be able to provide the right outcomes. And when people do the work, a lot of times they make their own luck. And that's what we want to do with our customers. We want to make our own luck by helping them to be successful. And all of these kinds of relationships can drive benefit as a result. Um, this also comes into play with risk management. So a lot of risk management happens here in the ad hoc space. Uh, we're taking choice, making choices based upon things that we're reacting to. And sometimes that is the worst choice to make because we are reacting to a, to a, we have a situation, we're reacting to it. Where we want our customers to be is in this proactive and intelligent space. We're taking choices, making choices specifically because we know they will lead to great outcomes. And we're driving intelligence through storytelling about what could happen if different choices are made. So maybe someone's thinking about buying a particular type of property, going into this sort of business, adding the side job, creating a, a 
sort of uh, they're considering renting out this house or whatever it is, right? They're storytelling through different use cases. And we want to help them to make intelligent choices about that and even model their portfolio based upon those choices. That's another area where next best action and AI can provide value to us by helping us to be able to model those out successfully. Um, so this is uh, an example of how this is so moving into some things that are like adjacent and related that I think will help you to see how AI is helping it drive some very interesting transformation. Um, in different financial spaces, you're seeing activities that were traditionally very manual in nature and human driven becoming very AI driven. So this is an example of an organization right now that is just gone live in California that is streamlining the application process for an average savings of about $2,000 for every loan application that's going through the process. So essentially cutting $2,000 that used to go to the loan officer out of the loan application process by using a chat driven uh, assistant essentially to help the customer through actions in the loan application process and helping them to make the best choices through that process. And one of the things that I saw through the ways that they were building that was the number of questions that they asked successfully that a given advisor would never know to ask was really significant. Um, so they've essentially built into the tool the combined knowledge of many different individuals that know how to validate these, these loans before they even get to the hard credit pull. That's something that you've also relates into financial advisory in the sense that like some person might know this, some person might know this. How do we amalgamate that and help them all to make great choices? Um, and this is where AI can streamline. You, If you've done your taxes this year, you may have also noted that HR Block and Intuit have launched advisor bots alongside with the chat experience, alongside with the tax experience. I think this is really nice way for them to start going live with this capability because it feels very natural as you are filling out your uh, your taxes, which is akin to maybe even another financial plan um, in a sense. It's starting to ask questions along the side where you miss something or there's a something you left off the list. And to a certain extent, it's rules driven, which many next best actions are. Um, but in this case, it's uh, asking them in a very intuitive way and allows you to ask questions about things you might not know the answers to and directs them toward different self-help options before it escalates them to a true customer service scenario. So you can see how in this case, they're building each of these agents right into the experience of them completing a financial process, but then enabling that to also connect into a human experience that they may even upcharge for um, once you need to move into that spot. So next best action in this ecosystem is both customer support and driving them through an optimal experience that leads to a better outcome, uh, particularly in the case of like looking for deductions or other things that are very complicated in the context of the tax code. Um, but they make it really easy in the context of the actual customer experience. So um, as we close this, I want to uh, do two things. I want to address some human first AI strategies that relate to this. And B, I want to make sure that we also leave a little bit of extra time at the end for questions. So as we're finishing this up, make sure you drop um, any additional questions that you have there in the chat. Um, and I'd be happy to answer those as we hit the end of the conversation. Um, so the first thing I want you to think about is as you're adopting these capabilities and you're lighting up, uh, lighting up commodity capabilities for your uh, advisors or employees, as well as building some of these capabilities that create competitive advantage. The thing we can't forget about is that this is all impacting people. And if we miss that, we're not only going to miss the chance to drive appropriate adoption, but we're also going to miss the chance to great, get great outcomes and optimize the person experience as a result of this. So one thing that you should be thinking about is that across all jobs, not just financial services, but across all jobs, you can expect a significant pivot from creative work, from repetitive work to creative work as a result of the moves that are happening within artificial intelligence. And that's not something that every employee within your organization is prepared for. Many people come into your organization and they're very comfortable uh, preparing the financial documents that the, they're going to review with their customer and talk about and go through in a very repetitive way. And maybe 
they're not really ready that like they might not have to do all of that activity in the future. And that space is going to be open. And the way I, I sometimes think about it is when someone has nothing to do, how effective are they in your organization at finding something that's effective to do? And some people are really good at that. Like they are great at moving from working in the business to on the business in a sense. Um, many people, however, have not used that skill very often and they're used to coming in and doing a role. And that's where their sort of personal self-worth is like attached to is that role. And this is going to be a pivot, even in the most positive leadership environments I've seen um, that some of those positive leaders have said one of the hardest things they've had to deal with is just the who moved my cheese moment. Like the uh, I a person who was so built up in a technology that they had been were using for a while and all of a sudden they built something in AI that replaced it very quickly and did it better. Um, being able to get on board with that as opposed to it being a defensive situation or um, pivoting their skills. So this move from 80% repetitive work, 20% creative to almost flipping that over on its head to more repetitive work, uh, to sorry, to more creative work. So how do we get started? Is it to learn data science curriculum? Is it to get off the ground? Um, you're going to have, especially in financial services, some data scientists and people that are building these kinds of models, especially in next best action. But it's not the big change to your staff. The big change to your staff is about enablement of adoption of tools. Um, so when you think about this in the context of adopting next best action among your employees, it's about this idea that everyone deserves an AI assistant. Everyone, like, you know, sometimes you have an intern, sometimes you don't, like, and some people are really good at working with interns. Why is that? Well, the reason that some people are good at it is because they're good at delegation, right? They're good at, like, taking a set of things and giving them something to do. It's like when you have your kids cleaning the house and they just, uh, like, they come back to you and you always have a new job, right? <laughs> you always have something else they could do. It's like, there's, you I have no lack of creativity around coming up with jobs to clean my house. Um, so everyone deserves that AI assistant to take on tasks, do tasks, return them to them. And the level of that assistant is continuing to improve in its capability. Um, and then adoption of AI, it's it's not necessarily about the, the adoption of new roles so much as it is about the changing of roles with new skills which is not limited to technical skills. It's about reawakening creativity and requires a growth mindset in every person in your organization. So this is, a, you're like, well, this is like not a IT conversation. This is like a employee HR conversation, a, a leadership conversation. That's exactly why I kind of end with some of these things. And then the last, the last thing uh, before I sort of talk about what you can do next is about the roles that exist in this picture. So as you're preparing some of these solutions, you're going to have a data engineer that is preparing your data for use in the scenario. You will have data scientists that build the trusted models that are used that have accuracy and precision and can be reviewed and can be tested and can be evaluated. All of that fits into this picture. You then have an AI engineer that may use foundational models to create experiences within your applications. So like maybe you have a uh, next best action model that's been built on a set of AI capabilities, but then you're layering that into separate experiences. Maybe there's a customer experience, there's a, a uh, advisor experience, there's a this experience. You're layering that into these different spaces, so the AI engineer or developer. But where this is going to happen the most is in the AI practitioner who uses this to create value in everyday work. They're an expert on the business, and their job is to enable that activity within your customers and within your organization. So where do we go from here? Um, this is what we've seen companies do that have been very successful. So first, they think about persona-based jobs to be done. If you've heard about jobs to be done framework, it's essentially knowing that like we do a collection of activities that activities have uh, a, a sort of source job that needs to be performed. Like the job, I don't care about like the preparation of a report I care about having a great advisement experience with my customer. Their job is to have the great advisement experience. And it, I either need the report or don't need the report. The question is, like, how do I have great advisement experience? And there, in that advisement experience, I need to do X, Y, and Z. So understand the jobs we've done associated with your personas. And then enable predictions of information to inform decisions that happen with that job to be done that then prescribe action on that normalized action. 
And then you get to a point where you can analyze single portfolios based upon that one workload. And that might mean a specific thing you're predicting or prescribing for. And then from that, get to a point where you can analyze the, the general portfolio associated with those same things. You can do it at scale. You can apply it across the entire data set. You can apply it against any customer group of portfolios or think about it in the context of uh, individual actions. But to get there, we have to start with the end in mind, which is that persona job to be done. And that's where these conversations effectively start. So um, as, you, uh, as you leave here, I want you to think about a couple of potential next steps. Um, first is AI and Copilot executive visioning workshops. These we are doing every week. Um, I have three executive sessions just this week with uh, the CEO, CFO, CEO, like these relationships of people who are trying to understand this in the context of their organization. Um, this is something that we do all the time. So executive envisioning workshops, as well as you know, driving that into company envisioning workshops that are centric to like teams, IT, investment teams, understanding how we can take advantage of this. And then uh, we can also do use case validation associated with opportunities to make this real within your organization. So as you leave, make sure you complete the survey. I a, would love to know if this was useful to you. Uh, B, I would love to have more conversations. And then uh, at, with that, I would love to take some additional questions. So if you want to drop any additional questions you have in the chat, um, I would be happy to take those as we go. So feel free to put those out there and I will uh, I will hit them as they enter into the chat. Okay, sounds like you guys are good. I am super appreciative of you spending some time with us this afternoon, and I hope this was helpful. Please fill out the form as you close down, and I look forward to having follow-up conversations with each of you about uh, leveraging AI to create next best action systems. Have a great afternoon.